started playing I started playing disc golf before it was disc golf, when it was still frisbee, when it was fall or frawl or something of that nature. Um, I started playing when I was in college, my senior year in college, for reasons I don't understand. One day I picked up the frisbee and wanted to throw the frisbee. And there was, there was a lot of frisbee playing activity in the school I went to, it was Vassar College, and I graduated from there in 1979. Tom Krajna, Judy Horowitz, Billy Bloom, uh, bunches of people there, very serious, uh, seriously on the fringes of the early, um, uh, early frisbee experiences of various sorts. And, and we were essentially all-around players. We did ultimate, we threw distance, we played golf, we did freestyle, we played double disc court. We, you know, it was back in the days when if you wanted to play frisbee, pretty much you did it all. Um, after college, I went to St. Louis and, and uh, played a lot of ultimate in St. Louis. It was a, a time, burgeoning time for ultimate in that town and, and uh, played uh, ultimate primarily and then all, other all-around sorts of activities golf being one of those. Went to uh, the, US, the, the U.S. Open in 1983 out of La Mirada, the one that's called La Masdorada. Uh, went out again in 1984, went to Santa Cruz in 84. But in 84 I also went to um, this new thing we'd heard of, the PDGA World Championships, which was down in Huntsville. So I played in the first women's division um, at, the, at the, the first women's division competition at PDGA Worlds in 1984 and came pretty close to winning it but uh, lost to Marie Jackson. I played played against Marie really a good bit. She was uh, for me one of the my, one of my uh, role models I guess you'd say as a disc golfer. Just cool as a cucumber and always relaxed and always played very well. So she won in 1984. That was my first experience. It's probably the first PDGA event I actually even went to was the one in Huntsville there. Um, Around that time, I moved to South Carolina from St. Louis, and in St. Louis, there had been a fairly big frisbee playing community. I moved to Greenville, South Carolina, and there was not a frisbee playing community. I used to travel on the weekends to Atlanta to play ultimate, and I took up playing golf more seriously then because it was a more of a solitary sort of activity. I could travel to where the courses were. There was a course in, in um, Charlotte, Atlanta Park. There was a course or two in Atlanta. I used to go down to Atlanta and stay with Patty Kunkel and uh, play golf there uh, occasionally just for fun and then traveling for tournaments was something you know you could do more or less on your own you didn't need a team you didn't need people to play with um, and there were there were I, I think when I moved here I was probably the only disc golfer in the state of South Carolina in a, 1983 or so I uh, met Coleman Thompson, who became my husband, actually at a tournament in Charlotte. Uh, went up there one weekend for a tournament. I needed somewhere to stay, and the rest was more or less history in our family, at least. Um, he had not been so serious a, com a competitor as I was at that point, but uh, once he met me, he got bit by the bug, too. So we, we traveled a good bit playing golf back in those days. Traveled out of Greenville. Um, in those years, 15, 20 tournaments was a lot of events to make it to. We would start in the spring down in Rockledge in Florida, and we would play tournaments as spring moved further north. We played from Florida up through the Carolinas, up into Ohio, all the way up into Wisconsin. Um, it was uh, not a good time for my allergies because I have allergies to the kinds of things that come out in spring and I was in spring six months out of the year, miserable with allergies half the time it seemed like, but, uh, but a small price to pay because we really enjoyed what we did. Greg will remind you about his very first throw. There we go. 1986 Worlds were in Charlotte. Of course, I was familiar with Charlotte because Coleman is from Charlotte. I played in Charlotte a good bit. Familiar at least with the course at Latta Park. The other courses that we played at Charlotte Worlds um, were new, essentially, for that event or temporary for that particular event. Um, 
but uh, it was a that that was a good summer for me. I got married in June and won the PDGA Worlds. I think it was in July, so it was a good year. Mm -hmm. um, 1987, we went to Toronto for Worlds, and uh, and again that was a that was just. It was most, one of the most fun weeks, I think, in my life, playing, you know, staying in Toronto, playing out in Toronto Island, taking the ferry back and forth. That was, that was a really great week. That was a great week, Tim. Um, altogether, I played in the first six PDGA Worlds where there were women, and I uh, came in third twice, came in second twice, and won twice. Uh, but after those six years, pretty much decided that if we were going to start a family, we were going to have to start then. Um, and uh, because I traveled for work as well, that we needed to kind of pull back and not play so much golf. So we essentially dropped out of disc golf in 1989, after 1989. 1989 was the last summer that I played, uh, actually my last tournament before we quit, I played doubles with Brent Hambrick hmm. at the 80, um, it'd be the 89 Worlds. And we came in second. Uh, Sammy Ferens and uh, Amy Beckin beat us. But we only lost by a stroke or two. <laughs> So that was my last event prior to uh, prior to taking a long break from disc golf. Um, Greg and Connor were born. Uh, we continued working, continued uh, uh, actually continued playing some ultimate. Moved down to Charleston area and uh, played ultimate down here when the kids were little, uh, but did not uh, didn't play any golf at all. Even though even some of the ultimate players that we knew, you know, they played a little bit of golf. There was a they told us about a new course up in Columbia called Earlwood that we should really get to, but it just didn't seem to be something that got on our radar screen for a number of years. And I don't know why I said this. The boy said, asked me what I wanted to do for Mother's Day, and I said, "Oh, let's go play disc golf." So we did, and uh, that that ignited, really reignited, for Coleman and me, and ignited for the boys uh, a, 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 another passion for disc golf. During the 15 years that we hadn't been playing, disc golf world had changed a great deal. Um, the discs were different. The what they called back in those years in the early 2000s, the candy plastic was amazing. Uh, our boys still don't believe that when you throw a frisbee you could just shatter. But back in the day when we used to play, we carried spares in our bags, not because we might throw one away and lose it, or not because, well, we wanted one that was tuned like this as opposed to like that. We did, you know, we did that for those reasons too. We carried spares because we were, gonna, because we were afraid we were going to break our discs. We did break our discs. At, in the middle of a round, needed to um, <laughs> needed to have something you could throw after that. After that happened, I was reminded of that the other day, looking through the 2013 rules, because in those rules, there's still the old rule uh, that uh, if your disc breaks, you, the, the your lie is where the largest piece of it lands, and that uh, for many players these days, I think that's an almost unfathomable situation, but. Oh. Anyway, when we got back, when we started playing again in 2004, it was uh, just, just a completely different world. There were so many more players, so many more courses, uh, these wonderful disc golf bags, these great straps, um, shoes especially for disc golf, um, you know, many other, you know, lots of magazines that had disc golf ads in it, that had tons of ads for, for discs and for companies and for tournaments and, and it was, it was, uh, it was a little different than it had been back in the back in the late 80s when we bought discs out of the trunk of somebody's car. We heard somebody had something. We called on the telephone. We didn't do email. We didn't do websites. And we didn't do blogs. We 
did it all by telephone and, uh, and Xerox machine and, and stamp mail. Um, once we started playing again, uh, with the kids being late middle school, high school, um, they had the somewhat unusual experience of spending most of their, most of those years uh, traveling around once again with us to, to tournaments. And, and so it became a real family activity for us. And if I go back and I look at the numbers of tournaments that we attended in those years, again, 15, 20 tournaments, only concentrated in the, in the seasons, relatively, were, were the tournaments close to us, that were reasonably accessible. Back in the, back in the uh, 80s when we played, Cohen and I used to travel long distances. I mean, we'd travel, think, thought nothing of getting six and eight hours in the car to go play a tournament, get in the car Friday night, drive to the event, play all weekend, drive home, get up for work again on Monday. Um, now we're, you know, there's, there's an embarrassment of riches, of course, is around us. We can get in the car and drive for an hour, drive for two hours, attend a nice event and go home and be home, and not, be home that, that evening or be home, you know, and a, and a, and a much, much, much more easily, much less, much fewer miles have to be put on our cars. I was reminded of that again. Uh, somebody posted, T Tony Tomasino posted a video from the 1989 Laurel Springs Open uh, on YouTube not too long ago. And it's an hour, hour and a half of footage, and he captures on camera virtually everybody was at that event. And there were a bunch of players from Florida, there were players from Ohio, there were players from North Carolina, there was jo Joe Mello was there. Um, Virtually everywhere that there were disc golfers east of the Mississippi, there was somebody represented at that at that event, and that wasn't you know a huge event. It wasn't a big world or something like that. It's just illustrative of how far people would go to play a good event back in the day. And, and we're just now we just have so many more so many more opportunities to to, to get out and play. Um, you know, as I've gotten a little bit older in the sport myself, you know, when we started playing again, I was real serious about it, wanted to be real competitive. Um, but uh, I don't know whether it's age in terms of gaining a little more perspective or age simply in terms of wearing out and getting older, but I am nowhere near as competitive about it as I used to be. For me, when I, for me back in the 80s when I played, it was all about competition. I could not enjoy a round of golf for the sake of enjoying it. It was always, always about doing better. About it was always, always about winning or trying my, trying, having the attitude that I was going to try really, really hard, and win. Um, but as I've gotten older, I think I've, I've, I've come to accept the fact that that's not going to happen. Come to accept the fact that there's really a lot of other things I, I want to do. And you know, when we played, when we played originally. Our life was work and golf, and it really wasn't much else. Um, but now I play a lot of music, I do some yoga, I work, you know, have household things to tend to that maybe I ignored a little bit more back in, back in the early days. Um, so, so disc golf is just a piece of, is a piece of, our, uh, of our lives now as opposed to the biggest piece of it. We do tremendously enjoy, as a family, our Christmas vacations. It's our tradition for the last, I think, seven years. We've gone somewhere to play golf every year at Christmas. Maybe a week, maybe 10 days, maybe just a few days, depending on how our, how our schedule works out. Three years in a row, we went down to Florida for what we called the Florida Disc Golf Experience. And we kept score, and we handicapped it according to rating, and somebody got to get bragging rights out of that. This year, we went up to Virginia and played half a dozen courses up in Virginia, went to a tournament in uh, in Stony Hill in South Carolina, and just a couple days ago on New Year's Day, in fact, drove up to Darlington to play a new course up there. Um, but it's something that you know that we do really enjoy doing as a as a as a family, throwing everybody in the car and all of our discs and all of our stinky shoes and and getting out and playing some.
be stripped inside 300 feet. Playing golf, is, this golf, is something I have always, always enjoyed doing. And I'm tremendously honored to be able to play with these same people today, too. You know, we have, we have tournaments here in the Carolinas where you've got three or four world champions, women's world champions, playing in the same division. There's not very many places in the country, actually, that can say that. But with Elaine having moved down here and Sarah Stanhope being right around the corner, and, um, yeah, you know, it, I can't play anywhere near at that level anymore. You know, it's not, that's not the way I play. And, that's not where I'm competing. But, you know, we can still round up a, a small but very strong uh, division of champions in the women's division down here in, in South Carolina.